Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Nick Packett. I'm a packaging engineer with uh, the DuPont Tyvek Medical uh, Packaging Team. Um, I joined DuPont uh, about 18 months ago. Um, prior to that, I worked for Covidian and I was the manager uh, for the Boston Scientific Urology Division. Um, worked on a variety of different types of projects from new product development to sustaining engineering, CAPAs. I've, I've been through a lot of uh, challenging and uh, rewarding times when it comes to packaging. Um, so uh, we're here today to talk about um, understanding how packaging can impact the life cycle um, of your product. Um, and I'm joined with my colleague Kevin Grum, um, and Kevin's going to do his introduction. Great to see some familiar faces. Hello, everyone. Um, Kevin Grum, I'm in a global technical service role. Uh, the last uh, about six or seven months supporting primarily 40L, uh, Tyvek's uh, newest medical packaging product. I uh, have about 10 years of experience with medical and pharmaceutical packaging, uh, all within Tyvek in different parts of our process and then downstream applications as well. So we're excited to share with you guys what uh, we feel is a great topic. So I'm going to step down and let Nick take it. Thanks. All right, so um, we're going to jump, jump right into um, the life cycle, right? What is the framework of the life cycle of your product and how can you understand it? And, and you know, simply, it is the steps and the operations and the processes that come into play um, and that need to happen to bring a product to market and to sell a product. Um, from packaging design all the way through product use, uh, we're going to walk through some of these different, um, different areas and these different operations. Um, and we'll discuss that how the decisions that you make when it comes to your packaging design are really going to influence and impact these downstream op operations. Um, I want to stress uh, that this evaluation is really a powerful tool. And uh, from my experience, um, when you work on cost savings projects, um, you'll often find that sort of the soft savings or the savings that you can achieve um, within your life cycle often outweigh the savings that you may have been going after when it comes to material savings or down gauging or a material change. Um, or maybe you're in the position where you've already driven the cost of your product um, down to sort of the limit of comfort, right? You can't down gauge or change your material any further just simply because it will not pass or survive your, your distribution environment. So looking at your life cycle may be a unique opportunity to see where you can extract additional value um, or, co or cost savings out of it. So just the sort of the, the framework, right, to, to look at where as engineers or uh, uh, cross-functional folks in different, different, different places within the organization may look, you know, we often are just sort of led directly to what are my direct material costs, my direct packaging costs, what is needed to provide um, product protection, um, maintain my package's sterile integrity, and you know, meet the device and the user requirements. And that's on the surface. That's what we all sort of can see. It's easy to see. But really, you have to dive down below a little bit. And that's really where these life cycle opportunities exist. You know, it's the hidden costs. It's the things that you don't anticipate that may be an inefficiency and cost you more. Or it may be the opportunity that you're missing because you haven't really taken that deep dive down into truly understanding your life cycle. Um, so we're going to walk through some of these. We're going to walk through manufacturing, pack out, sterilization, distribution, and your product use. Um, you know, it's critical that you don't underestimate the direct packaging costs and the importance that they, they play because, again, they really do set the stage for what happens downstream. Um, but, uh, you know, by really taking that deep dive, you can plan, you can predict, um, and, and you can predict those unanticipated costs to capitalize on the potential. Um, and at the end of the day, it can lower your overall product costs. So just like those direct material costs, there's sort of these, these traditional packaging design checklists. What do I need to do to bring a new product to the market? I need to make sure it arrives there safely, make sure it meets the regulatory requirements, make sure it's uh, maintaining its sterile integrity. And really, those things often drive your material and your design selection when it comes to your packaging. And again, this shouldn't be underestimated. It really is the foundation that sets up your package design and the selection of your packaging materials. Um, but if you can 
understand the downstream activities, you can you can you have the opportunity to capitalize on that and extract those that value further further down the uh, uh, the life cycle. But let's look beyond the traditional checklist. Let's look at some best practices that you might be able to do. When you're designing a package or you're redesigning a package, don't just think about packaging. Think about those other functions. Can you, can you engage cross-functionally? Can you pull in other stakeholders? You know, you want to speak with manufacturing. You want to speak with sterilization, operations, supply chain. What are sort of some of the things that they're experiencing and how can your package design influence or make their jobs easier or more efficient? Um, and get out and observe, right? I mean, you can ask people and they may have their opinion, but have you ever been out on the manufacturing floor? Have you ever actually sat down and tried to package a product? That's something that we used to do, um, would actually be to go out onto the manufacturing floor and sit down and you try to package this product or hand this package to somebody else who has no familiarity with packaging and can they package the product? Is it easy? Is it hard? What can you do different? How can you make improvements? So once you're through the design sort of process um, and working on the design process, really, right? Again, it's, it's, these things need to happen in, in, uh, in parallel. Um, the first step along the way is with manufacturing, right? Um, looking at your throughput and speed, consider your packaging materials when it comes to this. Are your packaging materials limiting um, the ability to run your equipment quicker? Um, if you try to run certain materials quicker, do you have yield loss or quality issues? Um, and therefore, you have to slow your manufacturing speeds down to get that yield and, and, and high quality product. Um, looking at machine downtime, right? How long does it take to change a roll on a form fill seal machine? Um, how many splices do you end up in each production run? What if you were able to fit more material on a roll? What if you went to larger rolls? What if you went to a thinner material? And therefore, you have longer production runs, less downtime, and ultimately, it's adding, it's, it's, you're adding savings um, and you're lowering your, your, total, your total product cost. So the next step on the life cycle would be your pack out, right? This is a very often a very manual operation where you're actually taking your primary packaging, um, pouches or form fill seal blisters, um, and you are packing them into cases or boxes. Um, and and it's, it's often that, you know, when it comes to packaging, you are trying to reduce the size of your package as much as, much as possible. Um, and therefore, you often need to squeeze and extract the air out of your package in order for it to fit. Now, that can cause... Um, a number of, of, of different issues because it's this manual operation of squeezing this package to get the air out that you could be stressing the seals. Maybe you're loading all the product into the box and then pushing them all down. And the thing that you need to remember is this is your last quality check, right? Pack out is the last operation where you or your operators are going to have visibility on that product. It's the last chance where your eyes are on that product to make sure that it's not damaged. Are you actually damaging it during pack out because you're trying to extract all this air out? You've got uh, uh, pressure to increase capacity and run quicker, so operators are packing like crazy. And what, what is the effect on your package, your seals, and your packaging materials? Um, so you have to ask yourself, you know, are my, are, are my materials the right materials for this operation? Or are they limiting this operation and causing it to take longer or introducing damage and, and, and yield loss? and things like that. So once you get your product packed out, next stop along the journey, sterilization, right? So let's just take a step back, talk about sterilization. What is gas sterilization? You've got your EO, steam sterilization process. Um, you've got conditions of high heat and high humidity, and then you have these pressure changes that are going to happen where you're pulling air out and pushing air back into the package. Um, so, you know, what's that mean for your package? Well, when you pull a vacuum on a chamber, if the air that's within inside that package can't escape at the same rate that that vacuum is being drawn, you get this pillowing, right? Your packaging is expanding. Um, and if you don't have the ability to accommodate that expansion, um, or just simply if it happens too fast, 
there go your seals, right? Or there goes your substrate if it's paper because you've got high humidity and, and heat that could be potentially weakening that material. Um, and so you've got a box of this product and you've got to accommodate this expansion. You need to design headspace into that, that box to, in order to accommodate that expansion to happen. Um, so, you know, a lot of sort of give and take and trade-offs when it comes to this area and a lot of things to consider when it comes to your packaging materials and are you, are you using a larger box than you, you may ideally want to because you need to accommodate that expansion. Um, but again, it isn't, it isn't just uh, a packaging problem, right? Uh, it may also be a sterilization challenge because not all sterilization cycles are equal, right? There may be more aggressive... Um, more timely uh, sterilization cycles that you can run that maybe your sterilization group wants to go to, but they're limited by the packaging materials because, you know, the gas just can't get out quick enough um, and therefore your, your packaging design and material selection is, is keeping them sort of boxed in. Um, So moving on to distribution, um, you know, we talked about that headspace that you may need to design into your package to allow for that expansion to happen. So that has a trickle down effect, right? Now you've got a larger box and it's going to impact your distribution. Um, it's, it's sort of common sense when you think about it, but sometimes it's not always thought about. But if you can... Uh, eliminate that headspace by utilizing packaging materials that don't expand or don't balloon as much, um, you're able to either fit more units per box um, or what marketing often likes even better is, hey, now you've gotten your box smaller. It's easier to fit on the store shelf. Well, what does that now mean for supply chain, right? Supply chain is now going to see huge savings because you can fit uh, more of these cases because they're smaller onto a shipping pallet. And can you also now, you know, you're reducing the number of pallets that you're shipping. Um, and a lot of the projects that, again, that I worked on, uh, material savings projects, if you were reducing the size of your sort of secondary packaging, you would see tremendous savings in distribution costs, especially when you're shipping long distances and, and ocean freight and things like that. Um, and then also just, you know, getting back to um, the core of, of, of a packaging, uh, package's purpose, and protecting the product, right? Considering your packaging materials when it comes to damage, product returns. Um, you know, if you're shipping product and you're seeing damage, you guys know what the, the impact can be. It can mean field action, it can mean recalls. Um, I've been part of recalls due to packaging damage. It's not really where you wanna be, right? You lose market share and then it's really hard to get that market share back. Um, and then also thinking about the new and emerging markets, right? What are these, new environmental conditions going to be in these new emerging markets. Um, we uh, moved an existing product that we had at one point into a new market. Um, it was a, a hospital settings that didn't necessarily have the best environmental controls. Um, when it got hot, they would open the windows, right? Um, we saw very high levels of humidity that actually were breaking down parts of the product. Um, and you have to ask yourself, well, what's that doing to my package, right? The product's breaking down. What's happening in my package, and what's happening in those in those type of uh, those types of environments that are these new emerging markets that healthcare is distributing product into? And the last, you know, the last step along the way is product use. Um, again, storage conditions. How is your product being stored? We'd like to think that our product is nicely being stored and nicely being stacked on product shelves or nicely putting, being put in bins, but the reality is that isn't the case, right? Product gets put in people's pockets, it gets jammed in drawers, um, it's not necessarily handled the way that you would want it to be handled. So selecting the right packaging materials that are, will survive the use environment are critical, right? The unanticipated storage, storage conditions should be taken into, fat and, and into account when you're designing your, your package. Um, and then lastly, you know, the actual opening, that final step of using uh, the package and, and presenting that product aseptically into the sterile field. Um, is, your, is, your product, uh, is your product package bringing value there or is it bringing an inconvenience 
um, to the user. If your package tears and exhibits fiber tear when you're opening it, uh, that user will question what uh, the, 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 the sterility of that product. Have they just compromised the sterility of that product because they have fiber tear? That causes them to have to go and get a new product. They've got a doctor across the room that's screaming at them for a product and they're in a, in a tough spot. So being able to use materials that really can limit that will improve sort of the, the convenience and the, and the comfort and the experience um, that, that your user has when, uh, when using your product. And now I'm gonna turn it over to my ke uh, colleague Kevin and he's gonna take this one step further. Thanks, Nick. Sound okay, everyone? Good? Okay, very good. So I was tasked with putting this into a, a real world setting, right? We wanted to have some examples that uh, stimulated questions and discussion here in the room and then also that challenged you when you go back to your organizations, how do you look at these, uh, these life cycles? Uh, so Nick's laid out this journey. Uh, what we're gonna do over the next few slides is, is focus our attention. Everybody still hear me okay? Uh, focus our attention on just a few key elements and a few stops on the journey that we've put some, we'll say, extra consideration into. Uh, and again, my hope is that it'll stimulate some discussion. Uh, depending on what challenges or, uh, as we like to say, opportunities exist in your role, whether you're in operations, supply chain, manufacturing, whatever it might be, everybody can look at their, uh, their total life cycle value and cost and hopefully make some changes that will improve your cost structure. DuPont does have an excellent portfolio of medical products. Uh, we obviously are here to promote that in part, but let's focus beyond just Tyvek into breathable substrates. Right, so this is paper, this is other non-wovens, this is Tyvek, and how they impact this life cycle. So in the next few slides, we're gonna look at the differences uh, and some porosities between packaging materials and how those correlate to uh, some real world examples. So I love the iceberg illusion that Nick used to begin the, uh, the slide deck. Uh, so there's some critical things that uh, a breathable package is responsible for, right? It's responsible to make sure you can sterilize a prepackaged device, it's there to make sure you provide and maintain a microbial barrier. And then it's also there to allow any off-gassing, whether it's EO or smells from like a um, radiation-based sterilizer. So in the bottom right corner of the screen here, we've got an overall comparison of some papers versus Tyvek 40L. So I mentioned at the very beginning of our discussion, a Tyvek 40L, I've been working on it for about eight months now. It's pretty much been my life. So why did we choose that? Why not focus on, on Tyvek overall? Tyvek 40L has this unique property that is incredibly breathable. It is one of the most breathable substrates we've ever, ever manufactured, very breathable out in the industry, uh, compared to industry, um, industry standards, also has a high microbial barrier. So to help accentuate some points of pack out, uh, sterilization and distribution, we're gonna focus on the porosity of these products and uh, some differences that we've identified. So let's dive into these scenarios. <clears throat> I'll be frank, those of you that know me, I like to put a dramatic flair on everything, but I can assure you that each one of these comes from a real world example, uh, a company coming to us, asking for help along the way, either a quality problem, uh, help identifying other cost saving solutions. Uh, so I wanna introduce scenario one. You've got blown out seals during pack out, but you may not know that they occurred during pack out, right? They may have shown up, gotten through sterilization, they may actually arrive at your customer. So your quality manager, your division, is talking to you about intermittent customer complaints for seal failures. And uh, originally it seemed to be just that, it was a random occurrence, but now you've seen a, a trend occurring where you've got more and more random packages bursting within. So when we went and consulted with this company, we said, well, what do, you, what, what do we need to look for? You know, how are your operators, as Nick mentioned, interacting with the product as it's being boxed? Are they grabbing handfuls of product and stuffing it in the box? Are they forcing air out to keep up with production, especially on a form fill seal machine as more and more packages are coming out? How are they interacting with that product? Um, is entrained air limiting how quickly they can work? So are they forced to smash the box down, to, to get it closed, to get onto the next box so they can keep working as the machine rolls on? Uh, and then finally, is there any way that you can identify through testing, are your packages bursting uh, before or after transport? So that could lead you to, uh, to looking at pack out as a, as a potential um, way to reduce uh, seal failures. So one of the tests that we did, and, I, and very rudimentary, I understand, you know, scientific method and all, a nice du variable dumbbell weight with some, uh, some zip ties. 
what you're looking at is an acrylic glass box that's made to replicate and give us a visual of what's going on inside a box when our operators are pushing down all those devices. On the left, you can see some paper blisters. On the right are Typic 40L blisters, so a pretty significant difference in porosity and breathability. Uh, on the left, after 10 seconds of basically putting them under the same weight, same number of packages, et cetera, uh, we've seen a drop of about six inches, seven, six or seven inches uh, of headspace. And on the right, we're almost to the maximum uh, level that we can push air out of all those packages. Same exact time, very easy to do, same force exerted, that kind of thing. Um, so when, why, why is this important? If you have an operator that's grabbing multiple bags at the same time or multiple blisters, when they go to squeeze, the air can easily vacate when they put them in the box. If that's your step to get the air out of them, they can compress the box much easier without as much risk to the seals. Our second scenario is that of uh, sterilization um, and uh, costs that could be too high. So you, uh, again, a little dramatic flair, but you overhear your sterilization group discussing the need to reduce their costs. Uh, they've tried, and when attempting to design you know, an optimized cycle, they uncover some quality issues due to seal failures, right? And so to kind of set the stage for everybody, in the bottom right-hand corner is a very rudimentary but high-level uh, ethylene oxide sterilization cycle. Uh, what I'd like to highlight is that this cycle goes through multiple vacuums, right? So you're vacuuming out all the air, replacing it with some moisture, vacuuming it out, injecting uh, ethylene oxide, et cetera. So we'll talk a little bit about what that means from a, from a physical viewpoint standpoint, but again, to follow the same process, what are we looking for? So are you, do you have specific cycles as, as the packaging designer that you have for specific cycles for specific devices? Meaning that you know, this one device has to be sterilized using this process because of the materials that you originally packaged the product in. It may limit how quickly you can run an EO cycle, or maybe you had to choose a different type of sterilization due to failures in the past. Um, you know, our package is bursting during these cycles. Nick did a, a great job overviewing what can happen when a, a package uh, inflates or balloons out, uh, the stress on the seals. Um, and another key thought when you're thinking about the cost structure of this at this stop is, are you sterilizing empty space? You know, because the, you're, you've accounted for maybe uh, several inches of ballooning of all your packages, you know, do you have to carry three or four inches of headspace in your box? Uh, so another thing to consider. And then uh, how long are you holding on to products for, for off-gassing after sterilization? So how long are you waiting for those EO residuals to escape? I'd like to focus our attention on headspace first. Um, so we spent a lot of time thinking and talking about this. Uh, just So what you're looking at on the screen here on the left side is two different sets of packages, um, one in paper, one in 40L, same number of pouches, same form fill seal machine, et cetera. Again, we're using our fancy acrylic glass to, uh, to show you what's going on. And at the top, in the top picture, just the weight of those lightweight sponges that we decided to pack, just the weight of those on the layers below them actually compressed down the material about an inch. Uh, compared to paper because the air was allowed to get out so much quicker. Uh, obviously, there's things to be considered like how you arrange packages, how things are layered. Um, it was just something interesting that we, that we noted. Um, so again, going back to this idea of headspace, you know, why do you need it? Is it a packaging material requirement? Are you failing due to blowouts of seals or pa uh, material failures? Or is it a cycle requirement that, uh, say, you want to run um, you know, very, a very quick cycle uh, and you've, you're pulling a vacuum very quickly, so fast pressure change? Are you blowing out seals? So um, some advantages directly tied to pack out are higher density of devices per box. So if you can eliminate that headspace, you can fit more devices in each box. Uh, and on the flip side of that, and Nick mentioned this, um, the marketing guys love decreasing their box size. So if you, can act, if you have that headspace, if it can be eliminated, can you then decrease the overall size of your secondary packaging? Uh, and I said we were going to talk about sterilization itself, so let's take a look at that next. Uh, so again, what happens to that package when it's sterilized? We've got a pretty cool image, a couple images on the left showing uh, a 40L blister, Tyvek 40L blister at negative one atmosphere versus a paper blister at negative one atmosphere. These are both run in the same chamber, same amount of time. And just after a few seconds, you can quickly see that the seals in the bottom image are being strained. You're almost seeing uh, tenting occur to the material. Uh, you've completely ballooned out. Well, if we had the video and we had, had time to watch a few of these, the 40L packages actually don't even move. They re retain their original size. So if you've already you know, evacuated some of the air there for both packages, you will see an, adv an advantage for um, how many packages you can put into a box during ster uh, for sterilization because they will not expand as much. Um, so smaller package expansion equals reduced seal stress and then reduced required headspace is going to equal more packages per box. 
Uh, and then just a consideration about novel sterilization methods. Uh, if you're talking about uh, vaporized hydrogen peroxide or some others, are there intense pressure changes? Um, is there going to be high humidity introduced? And uh, the fact that certain sterilization methods can react with different materials such as cellulose. So our third and final uh, scenario is a distribution cost change. So what to think about if you are the supply chain manager talking to the packaging manager. You know, we've relocated our site to have some cost savings. Maybe it's now a global enterprise. Um, you're shipping further distances. You know, the cost associated with uh, the shipping, you know, further distances is eating up that site relocation. What can you think of as a packaging engineer or as a supply chain manager on how to reduce that? And as Nick mentioned, each of these are a trickle-down effect. We started out with pack-out, fitting more devices in each box. We recognize that you are allowed to do that in sterilization because the packages may not in, uh, balloon as much, so you don't need that headspace. And the same thing then translates to this final distribution challenge where uh, you've considered your headspace, you've considered, oh, well, now that we have maybe a smaller box, we can change our pallet configuration. We can fit more pallets per truckload. We can fit um, more packages per pallet. Um, which, by the way, from a, just an a, a econo, um, economy standpoint, is you're also putting CO, less CO2 in the air. There's some, uh, some other green I items there as well. Um, are you considering what types of transport? This could be by air. Once again, going back to the packages ballooning, are you going through um, different, different pressure changes? By sea, this is a little bit off of breathability, but is, uh, uh, is moisture, you know, you're going across the equator. Uh, is moisture a challenge, something that you need to take into consideration? Temperature as well. Uh, and obviously by land, we're all familiar with distribution testing uh, and the challenges there. Um, so the last point for distribution cost changes is, is it possible to shorten the life cycle steps up to there? So yes, now you're taking more time, paying more for shipping around the world, so to speak. Are there different steps in pack out, in sterilization that can help account for that? Um, just a thought provoking question. So quickly wanted to recap, uh, you know, along, the, along the, uh, the life cycle value chain here, we covered pack out and handling, sterilization and distribution. Um, the DuPont team is all here. Uh, we are working every day as a team to come up with some of these challenges, some of these thought-provoking questions. Uh, it's not as straightforward sometimes as obviously we'd like it to be, but they do exist and we have seen wins in the industry. Um, for things like manufacturing, we're looking at how Tyvek compares to other substrates as far as how quick, what tensions you can run. Does that impact how quickly you can run it? Uh, you know, what type of sealing conditions you can reduce to try and get dwell time down? Does that, does that have an impact? Um, product use, we're looking at what the end use is. You know, is it, there's obviously a difference between cellulosic fibers and uh, continuous high density polyethylene fibers, you know, as far as contamination and bio burden. So we encourage you, I don't know, the DuPont team's all here, raise your hand. Uh, to, uh, to discuss these further. Uh, we're hoping to partner, partner with folks. We want to talk more about them. We know there's money here to be saved. Uh, we're just trying to find a way to unlock it. So thank you very much. Yeah, oh, it was off for a second. Questions? <laughs> Sorry, I couldn't hear it. So 40L, as far as a vapor moisture barrier, will be, it depends, liquid moisture is going to be around the same as other Tyvex. Um, depends on a little bit lower hydra head, but as far as air moisture, it will, it will breathe. Like a vapor will, will pass through, but you will not lose any material strength based on absorption of moisture versus like a paper. It's pure high density polyethylene, so it doesn't absorb and the, the physical characteristics are not impacted by moisture. <laughs> Very good. Uh, we've been able to achieve a, achieve a wide range. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, what type of seal strengths are we able to obtain with 40L? It's been a wide range, depending on uh, both if it's coated or uncoated, as well as the film that it's been sealed to. Uh, we have, depending on the end use requirement, everything from a half pound to one and a half pounds for seal strength. Again, depending on the film, we have a whole presentation, an educational seminar on seal strength and the science of sealing. Uh, when you go to a product like 40L, uh, you are decreasing your, uh, a couple of factors like uh, stiffness, and that can impact how, uh, how you measure seal strength. So we have a whole presentation on that, and I encourage you to join our seminars, which we pretty broadly, uh, pretty broadly publicize to, to learn more about that.